recording. Cool. Hi, this is Lindsay DeSwart and welcome to the Have It All Revolution. I am delighted that you can join us today. Now today, our entrepreneur, our mumpreneur is Stephanie O'Day. And I am so delighted to have Stephanie here because Stephanie has a multitude of talents. So she's a blogger, an author, a fantastic cook, is now also a TV personality and teaches mums how to make money in their pajamas. So Stephanie, thank you for being with us today. I'd love to hand it over to you so you can introduce yourself in your own words. So over to you, Stephanie. All right. Thank you. Although I have to admit, I really like um, your introduction. I should bring you around with me when I introduce myself at PTA meetings. So thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, let's see. So we are in 2016 and my journey online began in 2008. And it was sort of uh, a backwards type of plan. I, um, I sort of have always had an entrepreneurial mindset. I went to school to um, teach high school English, and I remember being in college and listening, well, then you're going to have to do this, and then you're going to have to do that, and um, uh, it's a bit of an of a anti-feminist thought, but at the time, at the ripe old age of 19, I thought, well, that's great, but I'm just going to be a stay-at-home mom, and uh, reality snuck in, and uh, the fact that, no, <laughs> I actually do need to make money. So I, I began running preschool centers, and I was lucky that my children came to work with me. But a few different things happened along the way that really got me to refocus that the best place for me was to be home with my kids, and I had to find a real way to make legitimate money. Okay. Uh, what did you yeah. do? Well, at, at first, um, so, so I was running these, these uh, preschool centers, and one of my big aha, like, this isn't working for me moments was a very prominent court case was coming into the courthouse that uh, the child care center. I worked for um, a county agency that was helping underprivileged children. So I was there every day, and a very prominent court case was coming to our local county courthouse. And um, a bailiff walked in and said, well, what do we have here? And I said, oh, well, this is a child care center. And we do this, 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 and this. And then he pointed to my little one, who I think was about 15 months at the time on the floor, and said, well, if we ever have a jailbreak, the first place they're going to come is here. And we wouldn't want anything to happen to this one now, would we? And so he, of course, had no idea that that was my baby. But it was. So I burst into tears and quit on the spot. And I uh, came <laughs> <laughs> it's horrible. I scooped her up and like, okay, we're out of here. So, uh, so that was my first job, uh, working as an, a full fledged adult that I quit. And then another one happened a few years later and I had two children at the time. And again, I was lucky that the kids could come to work with me, but, um, my two year old at the time was vomiting sporadically and we couldn't figure it out. And I assumed it was daycare germs and just kind of brushed it off. This is my second kid. I knew what I was doing. You're fine. So I'd give her little bags of Cheerios and some saltine crackers and call it a day. Um, but she just wouldn't stop getting sick. So I quit again. And, um, and uh, just a side note, she ended up having um, celiac which we all know now is a gluten intolerance, but this was back in 2006 yeah. and uh, gluten free and celiac was nowhere near as prevalent. So she's totally fine now, super strong and healthy, but it put this fire in my belly that I have got to one, make money and two, stay home with my kids. And so I ended up turning to blogging and, uh, and that was just through a bunch of Google searches, trying to figure out a legitimate way to make money. And I, um, I liked the idea of a recipe site because I've been very into um, SEO, which is search engine optimization. And I knew with the recipe sites, you were giving people what they were searching for. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I thought, well, gosh, what am I constantly searching for? And really it was chicken crockpot recipes, gluten-free crockpot recipes, and I couldn't find them. And so that's how a year of slow cooking um, evolved. It, it really just evolved that this, this I have got to figure out a way to make some money and to uh, 
writing for search engines. And, and that is how the site took off. Wow, that's a fantastic story. And I love that it's so, it was totally driven by the need that you had. It was a need, yes. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> so how did it go down when you told your family what you're going to do? <laughs> so my, my husband wasn't all that happy. So, yeah. <laughs> so um, the, the first job that I quit that was working for the county, we ended up having to leave the area. So I live in San Francisco Bay Area, which um, I'm sure as you are well aware is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly expensive. Mm -hmm. So we left this area and moved to the Central Valley. And I did get my wish of staying home as a stay-at-home mom. But the funny thing is, is I am not a hold still kind of lady. So I wrote for um, the newspaper. I had a column called Steph and Sensibility. And I was pretty active in the mother's group. And I, and I did start doing some editing work online. And then, uh, <laughs> so about a year into that, my husband came home. And um, he actually called from the road and he said, you know, I think the economy is all messed up here. We got to get out of here. And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, you got to go back to work. We're moving back home and home meaning um, back over the bridge to the Bay Area. And uh, 30 minutes later, there was a realtor at our house and we sold that puppy and, and we were thankful that we were able to get back here. Um, wow. So that's why. Uh, I had to immediately go back to work again. Yeah, you really don't hang around, do you? <laughs> no, Adam and I are the type of people when we make up our mind, okay, we're doing this. So <laughs> this is the whole leap and the net will appear. And that is kind of the story of my life. <laughs> Fantastic. So tell us a little bit about the journey of your Crock-Pot uh, blog. Sure. sure. So the Crock-Pot blog uh, started in 2008 as a New Year's resolution. And the reason I chose a New Year's resolution was to force myself to actually do it. And um, I'm not the best sometimes at sticking to my plans. I keep deciding, oh, I'm going to work out every day for the rest of my life and I'm never going to eat sugar again and I'll stop biting my nails. And that's not a reality. But for some reason, the forcing myself and putting it out on the internet for the world and, and honestly, Lindsay, the world in the beginning was me, my mom, and my grandma. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Like, Mom, did you see what I wrote? <laughs> um, so uh, after about a month, I was lucky in that the site got picked up by a pretty large blog, and I was featured on that blog. And that um, is now my cool. yeah. So it was today's creative life, and it's written by Kim Demon, who now we are very good friends and um, speak almost daily. So I appreciate that. And. Um, it was just such a like a mom supporting mom moment. She didn't know anything about me. And I had ended up commenting on her site as the Crockpot Lady. And through that comment, she clicked through me and read what I was doing and then decided to share with her readers. And so um, that was very cool. And then um, the other really big moment happened in February of that year and I made a perfect creme brulee in the crock pot. Um, wow. Which, yeah, it was kind of unheard of at the time. Now it's all over the place and I'm, I'm gonna take credit for that. Yeah, good but, for you, uh, congratulations. <laughs> now that is a claim to fame. It was a claim to fame and in the background while I was eating it um, at like eight in the morning because uh, <laughs> I cooked it overnight, the Rachel Ray uh, talk show was playing in the background and at the very end with the credits there was this blurb across the screen that said do you want to be on our show uh, contact producers now with an email address and I thought you know what I do want to be on the show because I made creme brulee in a crock pot <laughs> and I rock so um, I wrote into the show and I broke every internet etiquette rule known to man I wrote all caps I used way too many exclamation points <laughs> And I'm like, I am the best. And um, a few weeks later, a producer called and, um, and I was able to be on the show. My mom came out with me and we filmed in New York. And after that show aired, um, I started getting emails from book publishers. And, uh, oh, and my goodness. So we're, how, we're, how long had it been? <laughs> so uh, I made the creme brulee in February. The producers ended up calling, I guess, mid-March. We filmed the end of March and then it aired July 9th. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, all of that happened within probably six months of the challenge. And then by the end of the year, I had a, a signed 
book deal and a literary agent and, um, and all those things. And, and since then, I have had uh, four cookbooks and um, a household organizing book for moms and, um, and then also the, the mommy blogging book. So, Fun. yeah, I've been busy. <laughs> We've been so busy. That's just so awesome. And thank you for sharing the story. Cause thank you. The, the good news though, is I spend most of the day in my jammy pants and dirty socks. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I did do my hair and put on a nice shirt, but oh, we appreciate that. Me, it's just a regular old mom. <laughs> yeah. I love that. You see, and this is something that I'm so grateful for with all the mums that have been on this summit is there is the, the high reaching and high achieving and at the other end of the scale, there is the yoga pants and dirty socks. And I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't think it's fair to set moms up for perfection in that your house is supposed to look like Real Simple Magazine or HGTV because that's not real life. Real life is you have to get everybody fed and clothed and bathed and out the door on time. But the rest of the stuff is just noise. And if it works on a certain day, great. If you're having a whole bunch of people over, sure, get it all squared away. But on a day-to-day -day basis, this is your real life. And, and it's not edited and it's not Photoshopped. Absolutely. So on those days when you wish that you could edit and Photoshop, what keeps you going? <laughs> I missed what you said. What? On the days that you wish that you could edit and Photoshop, what keeps you going? Coffee. <laughs> Um, I think just coffee and, and knowing that uh, I am incredibly blessed and lucky that I am living this life where I can decide, you know what, I am tired at 9 a.m. I'm going to lie back down on the couch and watch The View um, instead of having to get up and get dressed and go to work. But then again, if I have a brainstorm in the middle of the night, I get up, I go downstairs and I turn on the lights and I get to work. And, and I appreciate the ebb and flow and, and the fact that the boxes that moms kind of compartmentalize ourselves in, that my walls are elastic and, mm -hmm. and I can stretch a little bit here and there. If I'm waiting in line at carpool and I have a brainstorm, I tell Siri to take some notes for me. And so she does it. And, and so I appreciate that part a lot, a lot. Yeah, fantastic. So do you have help in your business? Um, I have some freelance helpers, so nothing full time or anything like that. If I, I pull in a VA here and there, if I need it and I have a web designer who, um, is incredibly valuable. <laughs> Cause again, as you say, moms put ourselves in boxes, but we also think that we should be able to do everything and do it alone. And there seems to be a real thing about asking for help. And of course, I think that's what holds so many people back that they're afraid to reach out. Sure. Um, I think the older I get, the more I realize I'm really, really good at some things. I'm really not at others. Um, so we're mid-March, so we're doing taxes right now. I am not good at that. <laughs> I have friends who are like, just plug it into TurboTax. I'm like, I don't want to. <laughs> I want to say, here, do this. <laughs> yeah, you plug it into TurboTax. <laughs> so, um, so, yes. Um, uh, I have written a housekeeping and organizing guide where I lay out seven daily chores that I try to accomplish each day. That said, we've been sick. We, um, the kids have been home way too much, and I am hosting 30 people for Easter. So yesterday, I called... I looked in the yellow pages and I called a housekeeping service and they're coming next Thursday and it is an absolute fine yeah. <laughs> to outsource that type of stuff. So, um, and I, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And it's a give and take of what, uh, is important to you and what your budget allocates. If you allocate money for housekeeping, how, how, why on earth would I judge you for that? The, the same way you're not going to judge somebody from going to get their nails or their hair done. So I, I don't think it's an issue at all. Fantastic. Um, now, something that I'm really interested about is how does it work, the work-life balance? How do you balance being the mom and the family and, as you say, getting the, everybody out the door and then bringing in your business? How, how do you make it work? Um, I kind of use the mindset of paying yourself first 
And I think we hear that a lot with financial planning, but I actually look at it um, from my own life and my own needs is uh, I am not going to be a good mom or a good writer or a good editor unless uh, my basic needs are taken care of. And for me, that is showering. <laughs> yeah. And the coffee and, and the organizing, the, the piles of paper that come through the house. And so um, the best way that I've found to do that is to get up about an hour before the kids do and have some me quality time. Um, I try not to look at the phone or turn on the computer because the second I do that, it's no longer me time. I'm putting out fires or answering questions and then I'm on somebody else's time. So I try really hard to stay out of the office <laughs> and um, put on a cup of coffee. Um, I probably spend that time straightening the kitchen a little bit, um, putting dishes away, which sounds like work, but it's actually setting the stage for me to have um, a, a calmer and more peaceful morning that way. Um, in a perfect world, I would tell you that I work out every morning. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. So I have good intentions. <laughs> but sometimes my workout happens like, oh look, my, my coffee is reheating for 30 seconds. Now I'm gonna do some squats. So, so that is kind of the, the work-life balance. So, so realistically, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I know exactly what you mean because working out for me is my sanity time, totally, uh -huh. love it. Realistically, how many times do you get to work out? Because you've got such a down-to-earth perspective on it. You know, how many times do you work out? Um, probably four, four or five days a week. Um, but it, it's not a, a set time. Um, I have done it where I have at 11 a.m. a timer goes off and that's my, work, my workout time. But what I'm realizing is for me right now in building the business, if I'm fully coherent and awake and being creative, I would rather produce work than work out. Yep. Um, that said, I know I need to take care of my health in order to be um, a functioning human and a good role model for the children. So um, it, it could be in bits and pieces. I like that um, Swork It app. It's S-W-O-R-K-I-T. Mm -hmm. And it's a free app. And it um, has workouts in chunks of time down to five minutes. If I want a five-minute full-body workout, it tells me what to do. And, uh, and I appreciate that. If I've got a little longer time, that's great. And it has yoga, it has weightlifting, it has um, cardio, it has all of these different things. I do have a Fitbit, I don't know where it is, I'm not wearing it today, but I do have a <laughs> Fitbit. So um, I try to get the 10,000 steps in, and I don't necessarily consider the 10,000 steps working out, it's just life. Um, that's walking back and forth to school and around the grocery store and that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. So when you have challenges and difficult times, what gets you through them apart from coffee? Or wine? No. <laughs> um, uh, I think my family and I check in with my mom and my grandma every day. I've got um, a few really good solid friends who um, listen more than they talk when they know that's what I need. And, uh, and vice versa, we'll be like, okay, it's your turn to talk, go. <laughs> and, and we can do a brain dump, and I appreciate that. But really, I think um, knowing in general that if you're working online and you're a mompreneur, you're not alone. There's lots of people out there. Um, find a Facebook group that you connect with. Um, not one where they're just bragging about how awesome they are, but, but, but showing that behind the chair, there really is a basket of laundry that needs to get folded and, and, and all of the real life stuff. Yes, <laughs> you do a fantastic job with that. Absolutely. Thank you. What, um, so it's really interesting that you'd said about, you know, you have a friend or you have some really good solid friends. Yeah. Are they in business for themselves? Um, I have they pockets of friends. Sure. <laughs> so I have some that are in business for themselves and, and, and they actually are, um, we only talk business. And so they don't actually know very many personal details about my life or my family. Um, and then I have um, the walking to school friends who know a lot about, well, who's sick and, and I'm running to Safeway and what can I help you with? And, and those kind of core 
really, really good friends that we actually don't talk business with. Yeah. Um, and I appreciate that because I don't want to necessarily talk list building all day long. Yeah. <laughs> Even though my brain may constantly be somewhat focused on, on that and, oh, this is going really well on Pinterest right now. I, um, when I'm with these friends, I, I keep the phone away and I, I focus on them and our own kids and our own day-to-day life. Absolutely. Yeah. Do they even know what you do? They know I write cookbooks and um, I don't think so. <laughs> Have they seen- I'm okay with that because, you know, I think, um, I think they appreciate the, the fact that uh, I don't necessarily want to talk about all of the different things all of the time because it's noise in your brain yeah. and um and so if it's if something comes across like oh i got this really good um online course on copywriting i think you would really like it um my online friends or or the friends that i talk business get it but if i'm walking to school and i'm like well i'm taking this course on copywriting and so i'm thinking about this this and this and what do you think about as this is a hook just like wait what yeah. <laughs> and and so and that's fine that's fine i don't expect um, my husband to come home and talk engineering to me. So I don't want to know about his engineering. I really don't. It's math. It's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. That's so fun. Um, so how do you think being a mompreneur and working from home has affected your family? In a good and bad way, of course. I think it's only affected it in a good way. Um, I know what's going on all of the time. I'm able to volunteer um, at the school. I can do the chaperoning. I can do the driving back and forth to the sports practices. Um, I can talk to them when they first come home and they do the brain dump. And I appreciate all of that. I, I don't think there's any downsides. Every once in a while, I know that I'm viewed as not really having a real job. And so I think more is expected from me than a traditional working mom. But I'm okay with that because this is, it, it's a perk. It, it really is. I, I feel very, very, very lucky. Yeah. And do you think there's any um, skills that your kids have learned from you that if you were just a regular, you know, office job mom and you were away from home for work that they probably wouldn't see? Cause that would be a whole side of you. They never see. I think so. I think um, the, the balance balancing it all and squeezing work into the wings and squeezing parenting into the wings. There'll be times when I'm sitting on the couch holding the phone and, and the baby right now is six. And so she climbs on me and she doesn't know that I'm actually answering a work email, not just texting with a friend. And so they're, they often hear me say, I know it doesn't look like I'm working, but I'm actually working here. Give me a minute. Let me focus. Um, and then I can go back to being a mom. And so I think they, they appreciate that. Um, uh, I do know that there are times that, especially the baby wishes that uh, when I'm playing puzzles with her, I was fully, fully present. And I get that. And so it's something that I'm working on that. Um, and, and really, it's, it's uh, the kind of the Pomodoro technique of, okay, we're going to do 20 minutes and I'll set a timer and, and be very honest with her that mommy's in the middle of working still, but we're going to play puzzles for 15 minutes. And when the timer goes off, I have to go back to work. And, and that's kind of what has to happen. And for some reason, kids in general, they don't argue with timers. So <laughs> they just do it. Oh, the timer beeped. Okay. Bye, mom. Back to work. So. Oh, cool. But she's, ne- <laughs> she's never known any different, has she? No, I guess not. There you go. <laughs> Parenting with timers. Fabulous. That's my new skill for the day. <laughs> so your youngest one is six. Yes. And you have and two I others? Have, sure. And I have an 11-year-old and a 14-year-old, all girls. So they write... This year, they're in high school, middle school, and kindergarten. Oh, my goodness. So you've got three, <laughs> three schools pulling your time as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'd really like to know is, um, what advice do you have for somebody who wants to start out? Um, I think doing your research and figuring out what it is you would really like to do. So I have always written. I was an English major. I shine at writing. I think in writing 
not as much as speaking or selling or creating things. A lot of my friends are very good artists and creators. And so they have an Etsy store or they, they do things that way. My brain doesn't work that way. Um, but, uh, I think figuring out exactly what it is you would do, even if nobody paid you and then try and figure out the business side of that. If you're really, really good at giving advice and all of your friends are coming to you all of the time for advice and okay, now let's, now let's maybe take some coaching and some mentoring classes. So then you in turn can turn that into a legitimate business. Um, uh, and I think that would be my advice. People think um, I have a passion for crock potting, and that's why I wrote cookbooks. No, I, I, um, I have a passion for getting the food and like the cooking part over and done with as soon as possible. So that's why I like crock pots. I am not a foodie. I am not a chef. I am not going to have a Zen moment chopping an onion. It's let's get this done over with, plopped in the pot, push a button, and walk away. So, so that's what, that's, um, what I was already doing and then found a way, um, to monetize that. Okay. So you started off there. So let me just get it right. Did you start off with the book and then the TV came or was it the other oh, way around? It was the other way around. Sure. So I don't have like a regular TV gig. I, um, I've been on good morning America a few times and Rachel Ray a few times. And then I've been filmed for the, um, Ninja cooking system infomercial. And, um, the, the first appearance on Rachel Ray was because I reached out to them. And then um, the other ones just came from uh, different publicity to push the books. And then the ninja people came because they found me online as a slow cooking expert. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Now, have you had any coaches or mentors to help you build your business? Yes. Um, along the way, I have um, reached out quite a bit to different people and read an awful lot. I um, I probably read a business book every few days and, um, and I get different glimpses of, of, uh, if you're going to speak to crowds, then make sure you do this. So, um, I, I would guess that probably most of my mentoring comes from business books and, um, in, uh, speaking books and different things like that. And then when I have questions, I reach out that way. As far as formal mentoring, most of my online peers were sort of in the same part of our business in the same growth cycle. And so we meet um, in different Facebook groups or Skype groups and bounce ideas off of each other in that way. Okay. So you started it all off with a blog. Now, do you think the time of the blog has moved on or do you still think that's a way for people to start a business? <clears throat> That is a really good question. Um, I think in this day and age, you have to have an online presence, no matter what. You need to be Googleable, Googleable, and the, the best like that. way. <laughs> yes, and the best way and the cheapest way is to start a blog um, versus like a traditional website, and that's because blogs and blogging software are user friendly. If you can use Microsoft Word and PowerPoint, you can write a blog. So I started mine for absolutely no money down for free. And I used um, Blogger, which is B-L-O-G-G-E-R. And if you already have a Google account through Gmail or through Google Hangouts or G+, you already have the login to start a Blogger blog. So the first um, URL that I had was crockpot365.blogspot.com. And actually the first... I think the first two, I'm looking over here because this is stuck in my books, but I think the first three out of my five books, that was the main URL. So it was still a free site. And it wasn't until I decided to like, I don't know, grow up a little bit that I, I changed everything over to a full on .com. Mm -hmm. That said, it's a whopping $9.99 a year to get a URL from GoDaddy. So there's no reason not to, but I really wanted to prove to myself and to my husband that I could start a website and start a business with absolutely no money down. And so that's what I did. And ever since then, um, 
I mean, the, the site has constantly been profitable. I, I feel very uncomfortable talking money terms at times because what is a lot of money here uh, or not a lot of money here is a lot of money in other states. But the, the site and the business has always brought in six figures from the very beginning, yeah. even when I put no money into it. Um, and a lot of that is because it was built for SEO. I was giving people what they were searching for. And then in that, um, I'm going to give your readers a, um, or listeners a copy of my mommy blogging book. It is no longer available on Amazon. I pulled it because I wanted to do some editing. Um, so, uh, there's a lot of information in that book on, um, how I did it and how I tagged the different posts and how you do the links within and you reach out to larger sites um, in order for, for link love and, and SEO, Google juice and, and all of this kind of thing. But um, as an example, a friend of mine did the exact same thing I did, but with cocktails and the, the same thing, no money down, still has a blog spot. And so she writes a year of cocktails and she posted every day for a year. And so we used her as an example of, can we do this again? And, um, and it worked and, and she's able to do it. And she uh, is getting sponsorships and, and different people writing to her and reaching out for advertising. Fantastic. Well, thank you. I'm going to give you another chance before we finish to just um, to say what that link is. Oh, sure. And it will be clickable as well. So that's easy for everyone to access. Now, I do need to ask you, I'd love to ask you about social media. How has social media affected your business? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay, let me lean back here. So I, am a, I, like probably most people in the world, have a love-hate relationship mm -hmm. with social media. I think it is a fantastic, I'm repivoting in my seat. Yeah, um, comfy. Yeah. I think it is a fantastic way for people to find you um, and helps with the Google ability um, and searching for you. Because if your reader or someone or, or ideal customer likes Instagram, they need to be able to find you on Instagram. They need to be able to find you on Twitter and Facebook. But you have to remember that you're not getting paid. You're not getting rewarded for your time through those channels. So the best utilization of your time is to create something tangible that somebody can buy from you. And then once that's done, then focus on building your social media and the awareness. Um, if you are spending all day long building a huge Facebook page that has 500,000 people, but you can't sell to these $500,000 people, the, there's there's just no point and um and another way that i get nervous is if for some reason facebook or twitter or instagram changes the rules and all of a sudden you can't even reach your 500,000 people unless you are paying them it's a waste it's a waste of your time and so building your own site that you fully control that is seo friendly so if someone is googling crock pot recipes or cocktail recipes, they find you and then that in turn triggers an ad and you get paid that way or it triggers them being put into a sales funnel to buy your product, then you get paid. But, but otherwise, unless you're Kim Kardashian, you are not getting paid to Instagram. So it doesn't matter how big your following is. Fantastic. So how important for you has list building been and how early in the process did you start? So I, um, I started with FeedBurner, and, um, and again, this was back in 2008, so FeedBurner was the norm. And so from that, um, I guess I moved on to AWeber, uh, I don't know, not that long ago, 2014. So um, I get about 50 people a day on the list, um, which I've been told is very good. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think if I was to advise someone now, the list building would be absolutely the right thing to do because feed burner isn't as prevalent. People aren't reading through feeds. Uh, and the best way to actually still 
reach someone is through old school email. Um, that said, you have to provide value in the emails and you have to be interesting and a real person because if you come across like Old Navy and here's your 5% coupon, nobody opens Old Navy emails anymore because every day it's the same thing and they'll just ignore you. So you have to figure out what your audience is interested in. My audience is interested in crock pot recipes and I know that. And so for instance, um, I'll use this as an example. So just last week, um, I put out four St. Patrick's Day recipes. The year before, the title of my email was four St. Patrick's Day recipes. And I think I had like a 48% open rate. Last week, I decided to kind of be fun and, and more conversationalist. And I wrote in a subject line, I married an Irish man, dot, dot, dot. And I got 32% open rate. The people who wrote back to me both times were very thankful for the recipes. But for my audience, they don't want to know much about me. They just really don't. They want to know my crockpot recipes. That's what will get them to open. That said, once they open the email, I can write to them the way I want to write to them mm -hmm. and, and joke back and forth and, and be authentic and share family stories that way. But me marrying an Irish man is not helping anyone else when they're standing in line at the grocery store. They want what they want, and I have to know that about my particular audience and give them what they want. Yeah, absolutely. So with your recipes, and certainly with you know, a year of slow cooking, where do you go for inspiration? You know, it's, it's funny. I, I guess I'm, I'm more inspired when I have like quiet, peaceful time, and I can go within. And, and have quiet and um, write in my head. I'm not necessarily inspired all that much from reading other sites or flipping through magazines. I think I still consider myself my, my best avatar. And so I write to myself when I wanna write. If I'm feeling like, oh, I'm really in the mood for Cuban food. All of a sudden I'm in the mood for Cuban food and so that's what I'm gonna write about, so yeah. <laughs> Oh, wow. So I was going to say, I mean, do you have anybody? So how do you do it with recipes? I mean, do you ever share recipes? Do you take other people's recipes and change them up? Um, put your own spin on them? What do you do with that? Because you've got so many recipes. Sure, sure. Um, well, uh, a few different ways. So first off, we are gluten free. So all of my recipes um, need to be gluten-free and I write for Simply Gluten-Free Magazine, um, which is a really good magazine. And then I'm also the founder of um, glutenfreesearchengine.com, which is all one word. Um, and a funny story with that, I started that because my 11-year-old who has celiac was Googling um, tasty frosted vanilla cupcakes one day <laughs> and it was not... <laughs> You, you, she could not click on what popped up. I'm like, all right. So then we, we developed this safe um, search engine. And so gluten-free cool. search engine is, <laughs> is all very family safe, gluten-free recipes that are in there. But um, so mostly uh, if we go to a restaurant and I really like something, I start taking a few notes and I think how I can recreate this one in a crock pot and two, make it gluten-free. And I go from there. And then also my, my most recent book was Five Ingredients or Less, Slow Cooker Recipes. So really, I just went through my own stuff and figured out what do people really like and how can I simplify um, the method that way. Fantastic. So it is totally and utterly about stepping into your audience's shoes. Yes. And, and so it's a complete 180 because some people are like, what can I give? You're always viewing it from what your audience needs. Yes. Yes. I, I, yes, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, I am very cognizant of, um, other bloggers who are trying to run their own businesses and do their own thing. And so because of that, I actually try not to read other people's sites because I don't want to be influenced in that way. That's not fair. Um, this is a creative process and the creativity needs to come from within. And, um, and I don't believe in, uh, in tweaking one or two ingredients and then calling it your own. Okay, great perspective. So just before we close, please tell us a little bit just um, about your free gift. Um, oh, sure. 
Yeah, because I'd love you to go into a bit more detail about it because I know it's a very generous gift that you have charged for and passed. <laughs> oh, thank you. So um, it's funny. You are getting a PDF version, and that's because the print version is no longer available. And <laughs> I, I pulled it offline. Um, and so it is called The Mommy Blogger Next Door, Real Moms Making Real Money Blogging at Home in Their Pajamas. So this book is part autobiography, part how-to. And um, eventually, I'm probably going to do a course on this because I got a lot of feedback of, well, that's great, but what do I do after I do this? And I want step-by-step -step on day one, you do this. So I think this will actually end up being my um, lesson plan and itinerary for this course. And so you are lucky that you um, are able to uh, get a bit behind my brain before the course is launched. And... I think you will enjoy it and I think it will be mind opening that you can truly start something from scratch. If you have an idea, um, just start writing and start working on it bit by bit, day by day, and trust that the audience will come. And once you have something that is tangible and helpful to others, one, the audience will come, but two, when you start to advertise uh, through Facebook ads or um, through reaching out to larger bloggers or audiences um, through affiliate opportunities, you'll show that you've got this, this value on your site and, and in your, um, your, your brain archives. If, if that makes any sense, Lindsay, sorry. <laughs> no, I think it's wonderful. So if people want to find your recipes and especially want to learn more about gluten-free, because I mean, my family, two out of five in my family are gluten-free. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, absolutely. So I shall be looking up more of your crock pot recipes. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> um, where sure. can people find you? Sure. So my main URL and everything is umbrellaed under that is stephanieoday.com. And that's S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E-O-D-E-A.com. And then as far as the, um, the free mommy blogging link, I don't remember that link. That's but what you have have it. Have it. <laughs> That was a long one. <laughs> yeah, I'll do that for you. Stephanie, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. And I love your perspective on so many areas about getting started, about not being influenced by, you know, other people's blogs. And also, of course, about social media, which just sends people into a tailspin especially at the beginning so thank you for that I, I love the energy that you shared with us and you know such a real life story so thank, thank you. you so thank i'll just go on oh we're, we're going back and forth I, I i just wanted to thank you for your time and then one quick takeaway for your readers especially if they're starting out and um they are worried about social media go ahead and sign up for all the platforms and, and reserve your name. And then you know you have it for when you come back to it. Um, Cause it will always be there. Yeah, good idea. Absolutely. Very good idea. Especially if you've got quite a common name. Yes. <laughs> Get in there as quickly yeah, as you can. Figure out what would work throughout all of the platforms. So it's easier for your readers to remember. Absolutely. Yeah. Good idea. Okay. So I'm just going to close our interview today by saying thank you for coming to watch Stephanie, as I, Stephanie and my interview today. Um, I hope you've got some really good takeaways from this. Please make sure that you tune into all of our Mompreneur series because everybody has their own journey, their own story and their own perspective. And just like Stephanie shared with you today, um, there's just so much to learn from women who've done this been there, done it, and as you say, are still there looking glamorous up top and in pants <laughs> and dirty socks. I love that. <laughs> okay, so I'll say goodbye now and thanks again, Stephanie. Thank you.